Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Cindy Chavez here. Today is Tuesday, October the 23rd, 2018. It's 8 a.m. Eastern Time. That's New York Time. And this is your first daily dose of happy for the day. And uh, we are doing, uh, we're continuing an experiment we've been doing and hopefully an ongoing feature that we're doing in one of the groups on Facebook devoted to the Law of Attraction called the Law of Attraction Changed My Life group, which is a pretty big group. It's got a lot of members from around the world. And it's exciting for us uh, because, uh, Cindy, I, I had actually been discussing with Selena Dion, one of the administrators of the book, of the uh, group, rather, <laughs> of the book, uh, one of the administrators of the group about doing this, and she's been really excited about having us do it. And uh, so this is not only kind of laying the groundwork in terms of um, continuing to do podcasts to the group, but uh, we're also going to be doing some special events within the group that she's going to be involved with. And uh, we're going to do special situations where members can uh, ask questions, you know, maybe some of the, the more common questions that get asked in the group will get addressed and so forth. So it's going to be fun. This, this, this oh, is that's a, exciting. This is a breakthrough time, you know, it's really cool. Yeah. So how that's are you doing? Exciting. I'm doing well. I had no idea. <laughs> 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 right. I was like, expecting the podcast and now we're live streaming and that's really right. fun yeah 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 well you know welcome to the bleeding edge is what the way i like to say it right that's right yeah <laughs> no i'm ready and i'm you know ready to talk about some of these methods that we've been studying with uh neville goddard mm. always i i think neville's just my favorite and uh yeah i i really i think that neville's my favorite and the methods that Neville um, has that I've learned from Neville, I say Neville's taught me, you know, like he's sitting here with me in my office, but, um, <laughs> are always the ones that seem to get the best results for me anyway. So I'm excited that we've been working our way through some Neville material and reading some Neville stories. And so that's been good. So you've got a lot going on though. I'm curious oh. about what's, what's, uh, you know, happened over the last, week since I've been with you last Wednesday. Uh, so it's almost been a week. It, it would probably and... take the hour for me to describe everything that's <laughs> going on in the last week. It's been quite a week to say the least, but, uh, it's exciting. I mean, um, I, I think probably one of the most exciting days was after I'd gotten the testing done for this live streaming thing so that we can do this on a regular basis and contacted Selena, who's, like I said, one of the admins of the group. And she was so excited when she heard about the idea of being able to do it and so forth. And, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I want to thank her for all of her cooperation to make this possible. But, Indeed. uh, she, I mean, I, I don't know if I can convey how excited she was. I mean, she was practically, she was, when I talked to her, we did a private video phone call. And while we were doing the, the call, she was, I think she was working with her child and, and she was just grinning. It was just fun <laughs> <laughs> because think about the possibilities. What we're doing here is, is we're making it possible for people to, you know, take advantage of technology, the modern technology, to interact directly with others, um, particularly when they're trying to learn more about how the law of attraction works. I mean, that, that's what happens in the group most of the time. People are posting about, oh, you know, I, I'm trying to get my ex back or, you know, I, I can't seem to get a job or, you know, what's it going to take to attract money and so forth. And, you know, there's always com communication and conversation. But sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. And it's so much easier than trying to type it all out, you know, to actually have a conversation. So we're hoping to get to the point pretty soon where we're going to be doing that on a regular basis, and it's going to be fun. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. I've, that's something that I've wanted. You know, we've talked about this for almost a year now, mm. um, people calling in, uh, doing some coaching uh, in the podcast, people calling in, asking questions. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'm very excited. And it's about fun that. that we're doing Neville too. I mean, we're we're also both Abraham Hicks fans, and uh, we, we we have a lot of people that we follow, of course. Um, but it, I, I like the idea that we're tying all of the different uh, law of attraction experts, so to speak, together into one package. Because so often you get, uh, you know, there, there are groups, and they're, they're fine, but there are groups that are de dedicated just to Neville or just to Abraham or just to Joe Depenzi or something like that. And it's like, you know, we have all these great teachers. Why don't we just, you know, resource all of them? So I, right. I like the fact that we're doing that, right? <laughs> really? I talk about, I don't want to limit myself. Right, um, exactly. There's so much information out there, and I really want to to take it all in. And, you know, I think that, it's like anything else in life. Some of us are going to 
um, connect better with a different teaching than an, than someone else might with some other teacher or teaching. And, you know, whatever works for you, whatever feels best, that's the thing that's going to get us the best results. So why not listen to what, you know, pretty much all the teachings are out there concerning law of attraction. If it feels good, then follow it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, so Walt, would you like to cover promos early in the show today? Yeah, we should probably do that, huh? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> so, but yeah, first things first. We want to encourage our uh, new listeners, especially those in the Facebook group, but also people who are new to the podcast and uh, um, haven't uh, heard more than an episode or two, please become a subscriber. Uh, because when you subscribe, first of all, it's free. Second of all, you get all of our podcast episodes that we do every week. Uh, we do 11 shows a week. And that's a lot of good content, uh, one-hour shows, and you can get all of them streaming right to your smartphone to play on demand whenever you want to. Uh, we even have, I love this part, we even have binge listeners. We have people who binge listen to our show, and I just, I get excited. I get goosebumps whenever I think about that. <laughs> but yeah, no, really good stuff. But anyway, if you're listening on the Facebook group, I actually put in links in the, uh, um, the, the post area about uh, if you're either an iPhone or iPad user or if you're an Android user, you just click the right link and it'll just walk you through the process of uh, setting it up so that you get all the podcast episodes coming right to your phone. And for all of our subscribers and indeed all of our listeners, um, we've been doing a thing now for the last three or four months where we've been asking our, our listeners to please share the fact that they're listening because we want to reach more and more people and help people get that daily dose of happy. That, that's what we're about. We're about helping people lift their vibration, get into a better feeling space by doing these podcasts every day and uh, the the campaign has worked tremendously well we've doubled our listenership in the last four months just by doing that just by asking our listeners to post that they're listening to LOAToday.net on facebook or twitter or instagram or reddit or you know linkedin whatever it is that they use um so please you know do share the fact that you're listening because it makes a big difference and those are our promos for the day you know i i love every time that you do the promo asking people to share that they're listening for one main reason, but I really love that you said we've doubled our listenership in the last few yeah, months. Right. Um, and you know, I love it so much because it's a thing that sometimes people forget when they get into law of attraction is we start learning these new methods and many of them have to do with our own personal thought processes Right. Or maybe we do methods that, uh, require us to pick up a pen. You know, we do a focus wheel or we start journaling or something, but a lot of those methods are kind of inner work and personal work. And the game really does start there. I mean, it's all an inside job, right? It does start with our thought processes and our vibration, but sometimes we forget to just let the world know what we want. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. By saying, this is what I'm looking for. Just reaching out and saying, we'd love it if you would share, um, on social media that just say, I'm listening to LOA today.net. Um, you know, that's a really simple request and look at the, the return on that, that you've gotten already. That we've gotten. And yeah. so, yeah. So sometimes we forget to kind of put it out into the world if we're looking for, um, a mate or we're looking for a job or we're looking for some kind of opportunity or whatever. I think the, the inner work and the vibration work, of course, we always say this alignment first, alignment first it is the most important thing to come first. But the rest of it is let people know, <laughs> let people know what you, what you'd like. Absolutely. Cause if, well, not just let the people don't let the universe know, let everybody know. Cause if you don't put it out there, you're not going to get it back. Right. You got to put it right. out there in order to get it. Right. And that's how I think we let the universe know is we're we're OK with asking for it or we're OK with letting people know. It's one of the things that I know I've talked about this before. But when I heard somebody say one time, if you're looking for a job, what's the most important thing you can do? And they were speaking to a crowd, asking an audience and the the audience didn't have mics. So. I, as the listener, couldn't hear what they were saying, but, you know, a person would say something and the speaker would say, okay, yeah, yeah. But I could tell it was not what they were looking for. And then someone said it and it was like, bingo. What was it that they said? They said, tell all your friends that you're looking for a job. Like, tell the people you know. <laughs> right. And, 
And so, you know, yes, we want to get into alignment first, and then we also want to send some resumes out. So yeah, that does we help. Want in, yeah, we want to get into alignment first, but then we also want to let our circle of friends know, you know, I'd, I'd really like to find uh, a relationship or whatever it is we're looking for. Yeah, put it out there. Don't be afraid to put it out there because that's how the universe works through other people. <laughs> By the way, now, I, want, I, I want to acknowledge something. Um, we already have somebody who's responded on the uh, the Facebook group. We, Celeste has just uh, waved at us, so I just want to say hello, Celeste. We saw your wave. Hello. Thank you for waving. <laughs> Waves back. <laughs> we can wave back. So that's that's the important thing. Be willing to put it out there, right? Absolutely. And then and then we're studying Neville, who I, Neville might disagree with me because Neville Neville does such powerful work and that things just seem to come our way when we create it in our imagination. And that's what we've been talking about. We've been working our way through the Neville Goddard book called Out of This World. And we've covered the first chapter and this almost the rest of the second chapter. So what I thought we could do today is finish up the second chapter. And then I have I found a great Neville story that I'd love to tell. And then we'll see where we go. How's that sound? That sounds good. Just to uh, let people know who may not be aware, we try to let you know every time, but uh, sometimes we, we forget. So just want to make sure I get it in there. You can follow along because Neville's books are all online. So in, in this particular case, uh, the book is located at nevillegoddardoutofthisworld.org. And if you go to that page and then click where it says Chapter 2, scroll to the bottom, you will be able to follow along. So please Perfect. do follow along. Yeah. So just a little recap of what we've covered up until now. It's pretty simple. Um, it might not, not always be uh, easy, but <laughs> <laughs> Neville talks about, he uses the word, a waking dream. And he's really talking about what, what I would have always called a meditation, but getting ourselves into a relaxed state and then using our imagination. Um, sometimes we hear this called visualization. We hear a different terms for it. Uh, but he's, he's talking about if we could control what goes on in the fourth dimension. And that's like the dream world, our imaginary space. It's, it's, you know, kind of what's going on in our head, I think. Um, and he says, we learn this control through the waking dream where our attention can be maintained without effort for attention minus effort is indispensable to changing the future. We can, in a controlled waking dream, consciously construct an event which we desire to experience in the three-dimensional world. So he's talking about this this world we live in and we experience uh, every day. So he's talking about creating something in our imagination that we then experience manifesting what we call in real life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the sensory impressions we use. To construct our waking dream are present realities displaced in time or the four-dimensional world. All that we do in constructing the waking dream is to select from the vast array of sensory impressions those which, when they are properly arranged, imply that we've realized our desire. So I'm going to stop there and say Neville has instructed us to think of a small scene that would happen once we've already got the thing that we're desiring. So perhaps if we were looking for a new job, that scene would be walking into our new office on the first day of work or something like that. It's just a small scene. He says, with the dream clearly defined, we relax in a chair and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep, a state which, although bordering on sleep, leaves us in conscious control of the movements of our attention. When we have achieved that state, we experience in imagination what we would experience in reality were this waking dream an objective fact. In applying this technique to change the future, it is important always to remember that the only thing which occupies the mind during the waking dream is the waking dream, the predetermined action which implies the fulfillment of our desire. How the waking dream becomes physical fact is not our concern. That mm -hmm. seems one of the things that trips us up when we first get into law of attraction or maybe even after we've been practicing law of no attraction. No kidding, yeah. We have, <laughs> we have a tendency to want to figure out the how. And Neville is saying how it becomes physical fact. That's not our concern. 
right. our acceptance of the waking dream as physical reality wills the means for its fulfillment. And then he, he winds up this chapter saying, let me again lay the foundation of changing the future, which is nothing more than a controlled waking dream. Define your objective. And I have the, I actually have the physical book in front of me, the, the, the actual book. And these are numbered in the actual book. Oh, okay. And I, I noticed that they weren't numbered here. Right. So they're numbered. Number one, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. And how many times do we talk about this, right? You can't have what you want if you don't know what it is. So it's like, be clear about what you want. When we, the clearer we can get about wh- what it is we want, the better chance we have of creating it. Uh, so define your objective. Know definitely what you want. Number two, Construct an event which you believe you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. Something which will have the action of self predominant. So you want to be involved <laughs> in this little scene. Yeah, that's a key um, point right there, by the way. He, he mentioned this, and we talked about it uh, last week, that, that you want to be a part of the scene. But it's really an important part because so right, often... And- I mean, we, when we try to imagine these things, we kind of do it from the observer perspective, and that's not the right perspective at all, is it? Right, and I was going to say that too. Not only do not only do you want to be part of the scene, but you want to be like in your body. So, in this imagination, it's not like you're watching a movie. You are not watching yourself walking down a beach. You are feeling the sand under your toes and smelling the salt air and feeling the sun on your shoulders walking down the beach like you're in your body and that is very important so construct an event which you believe you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire something which will have the action of self-predominant an event which implies the fulfillment of your desire and then number three immobilize the body the physical body and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep. Then mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now so that you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you now to realize your goal. And yeah, so the, that, 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 that mobilizing, part, the, mobilizing the physical body and, and inducing a state of consciousness akin to sleep is the way he says it. And, and he said that previously as well, right? This, we, we pretty much decide right. this is very equivalent to meditation, isn't it? I believe so. And also the other thing, and he, he talks about it in other places. I know we've read a couple of his books and he's talked about it before. And that is actually doing this, um, when you are falling asleep at night. Mm. So it can be done at other times as well, but then also take advantage of that period of time where you're, where you are immobilizing your body to fall asleep and allow, allow yourself to use that time as well, because that's the perfect time. And he does talk about that being really crucial. Uh, and you'll hear it in the story that, that I'm going to tell you after we finish this chapter, the person talks about these exact things. And so it's, it's good to hear somebody how they created something using this method. Um, he says, experience has convinced me that this is the perfect way to achieve my goal. However, he says, my own many failures would convict me were I to imply that I've completely mastered the movements of my attention. I can, however, with the ancient teacher say this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize. That's another thing is that we'll find that Neville Goddard quotes Um, New Testament Bible verses a lot. Mm -hmm. He, however, has a very different definition for most of what he believes them to mean. So (laughs) they're very esoteric. Yeah, you want to kind of skip Um, the the, the Sunday school teachings and just go directly to the Neville decoder ring. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So he says here, you know, and I think this is an encouragement, actually. He talks about his own failures. But uh, just to know that these things take practice. And the more we practice, the better we get at it. Which is true. I mean, that's something that, that I know I've experienced. I'm, I'm sure you have. Virtually everybody who's ever tried to become a deliberate creator using the law of attraction runs into this. I mean, you try it and you just don't seem to pull it off right. 
And and at first you're saying, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And then over time you begin to realize, oh, I guess there are a number of things. If my vibration is wrong, if I'm, if I have some resistances that I didn't know about, you know, there's a variety of things that, that get in the way. But the point is, yeah. you don't give up. You just keep practicing. You keep trying to get better and better and better at it. And not surprisingly in one sense, but surprisingly in another, in another sense, we do get better. It just we, we do we get better at it. And I've been noticing that in my own practice using Neville's methods, um, what I notice, number one, yes, really important to keep that little scene that you construct short. And, you know, at one point, Neville mentioned um, walking up a flight of stairs, if that were to be the, the logical thing that would happen. And I thought, what would that what would someone's goal have to be for walking up a flight of stairs to be the logical thing that might happen? (laughs) (laughs) And then I thought, well, I mean, what if, what if they were desiring an upstairs apartment and they got one or a job that was up in an office that was upstairs. And so for them, you know, the manager handing them the key to their apartment and they're walking up a flight of stairs to go to their new place, that would be, and that's enough once you imagine that little vignette, you go back and you imagine it again and, and keep imagining it again until it becomes very real, until you can feel the stairs under your feet kind of thing. And so what I noticed is that whenever I would try to make, invent a scene that would be too detailed or too many things, like I find myself writing a script, you know, where I've, where it's long, then the imagination has a tendency to want to wander off somewhere else. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, wait a minute. What am I thinking? I'm way over here thinking about something that has nothing to do with this goal anymore. But when I started constructing scenes that were shorter with maybe just a a few words spoken um, and I can do them over and over, then, then my imagination stops wandering and I can really, I can really understand how I'm getting better at focusing on that thing and how it starts to become much, much more real to me until it's just, I, it's so real. And so that's what we're going for here. So I want to read this story, um, of Neville's of a person that wrote to him. She, um, I'm not sure if it's a woman. Uh, no, it is. It says made her dream a reality. So this is a, an artist and this is back in the sixties. She said, ever since I entered into the art field, I have enjoyed doing sketches and paintings for children's rooms. Hmm. However, I've been discouraged by advisors and friends who were far more experienced in the field than I. They liked my work, admired my talent, but said I would not get recognition nor pay for this type of work. Somehow, I always felt I would. But how? <laughs> and I that made me laugh because I thought, Yep, we're always, that's the first right. place we go, right? <laughs> How? Of course, How? of course. <laughs> she said, then, last fall I heard your lectures and I read your books and I decided to let my imagination create the reality I desired. This is what I did daily. I imagined I was in a gallery. There was a great deal of excitement about me. On the walls hung my art, only mine, a one-woman show. And I saw red stars on many of the pictures. This would indicate that they had been sold. This is what happened. Just before Christmas, I did a mobile for a friend who showed it in turn to a friend of hers who owns an art import shop in Pasadena. He expressed a desire to meet me. So I took a few samples of my work along. When he looked at the very first painting, he said he would like to give me a one-woman show in the spring. The night of the opening, April 17th, an interior decorator came and liked and commissioned me to do a collage for a little boy's room, which will appear in the September issue of Good Housekeeping for the 1961 House of the Year. Oh, my God. Wow. (laughs) Later... Later, during the showing, another decorator came and admired my work so much, he asked if he might arrange for me to meet the right, it's in quote, the right interior decorators and the right owners of galleries who would buy and display my work properly. 
Incidentally, the show was a financial success for the owner of the gallery as well as for me. The interesting thing about this is that seemingly these three men came to me out of the blue. Certainly, I made no effort during the time of my imagining to contact anyone. But now I'm getting recognition and I have a market for my work. And now I know without a shadow of doubt that there is no no when you seriously apply this principle that imagining creates reality. Wow. What a story. Yeah, isn't it great? I mean, there's there's quite a few great Neville stories floating around about people that have used this technique. And it's just the one technique we're talking about, really. Um, If you read Neville, you will hear a phrase over and over, and that is to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And you see that that's what's happening here. Um, When you imagine that little vignette that you design over and over, you begin to be able to feel what it would feel like once your wish was a reality. I like the fact and that I, we had details too. I mean, she, she said she was up for what was a good housekeeping magazine, like a home of the year thing or something like that. It'd be fun to go back yeah, to, to like the, she, the archives in the library or something like that and see right. if you could find the 1961 good housekeeping, you know, special oh, in homes or something like that. That's a great idea. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She said that during the night of the show, the one woman show, and that's one of the things she imagined. She imagined a gallery with only her art and many of the pieces sold. And that's exactly what happened. But not only that, then it, you know, it turned out to work its way into other people seeing her work. And then she got a market for her work and Mm -hmm. recognition. And yeah, that's pretty good recognition when, when the collage you do for a little boy's room ends up in the house of the year in good housekeeping. (laughs) No kidding. Yeah. And, and I, I like the timeline. I don't know what time, I don't know when it was that she had started. Um, but it says that she had given, um, a mobile that she made before Christmas to a friend. And then the night of the opening was April. And then her issue of good housekeeping was September. So you notice, she started doing this imagining work and she had created something for a friend who ends up showing it to another friend. See how the people were involved. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, and that was right before Christmas and look, four months later, she has her own one woman show. That's pretty quick work there. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 you know, that's the kind of response that, that you hope for when you try to become a deliberate creator, right? You, you hope that it, it's quick, that it's a relatively, um, soon situation because when you're first trying it out, your, your, your faith level, your belief levels, not as good as it could be. So when you get a good response like that, it helps a lot. Yeah. But there's, there's time involved. You know, mm-hmm. uh, even Abraham talks about that buffer of time and how, beneficial it is to us that we don't, you know, wish for something and boom, have it manifest immediately. Right. We we think we want that, (laughs) but it would probably cause a lot of trouble. (laughs) It might. It might. I think the longer we spend um, imagining something and, you know, doing the inner work to create it, we do get clearer and clearer on what we want. And I think that's important too, to create something, you know, that's going to last <laughs> something we don't mm-hmm. want to get rid of as soon as we manifest it. Cause it just happened too fast. It's like, I thought I wanted that. I guess I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that happens sometimes too. Right. Yep. Yeah. I so agree. that was the end of chapter two that we finished. And then that great story. And where'd, what, the, where'd the story come from? The story. Neville has a book called The Law and the Promise. And that book is full of stories as well as teaching. Like pretty much every chapter of that book will have a story or a letter that someone's written him with their own, you know, experiences in it. And it's, it's a good one. It's very encouraging. (laughs) It's always encouraging to hear other people's success stories. Yeah, right. Right. Which is why we did a a whole book of them. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. We did a whole book. Yeah. 50 odd. I can't remember what the final count was, but quite a few 
law of attraction successfully attracted success stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what? They were all different. They were all different methods used. And mm-hmm. some of the people that wrote those stories didn't even know about law of attraction when they had the experience. That's true. And then learned about it later and looked back and realized, oh my goodness, this is how this unfolded. You know, I think that's really awesome. I think we can all probably do that. Actually, I think I did. I think I, w- I wrote some of those stories where I wrote them before I knew about the law of attraction and oh my yeah. God, what just happened here? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, so, yeah. so would you like to tackle chapter three of out of this world and see where we go? Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it's too long. Um, we've, it's, the book only has four chapters. So we've previously covered one and two on other podcasts. So this could be three. Okay. Once again, Neville does a lot of, uh, scripture quoting. And I will tell you that his, if you go back and listen to the, the podcast that covered the beginning of the book and some of the other Neville things we've done, you'll, you'll recognize that, um, his, definitions or his interpretations of Bible verses are probably not what you've heard before. Um, sometimes we say some people would think they were um, heresy and <laughs> some people would think they were awesome. Um, I just like his <laughs> teachings regardless of how he defines these verses, but he starts this chapter with one. So I thought I would throw it out there. Well, I, I just he, like the fact that you combine the words heresy and awesome in the same paragraph. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a free thinker over here. <laughs> I can tell. I love that about you. <laughs> I think I think you said I was the LOA today. Um, I, I was the head of the Department of Wu uh, over here. So, <laughs> yeah. I think I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. So let's see. He starts with, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, men claim that a true judgment must conform to the external reality to which it relates. This means that if I, while imprisoned, suggest to myself that I am free and succeed in believing that I am free, it's true that I believe in my freedom, but it does not follow that I'm free for I may be a victim of illusion. And, and we hear this a lot, right? We, oh, this is hear it. I not, experience it. We, we hear all the time people say, but this is how it really is. Like, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But because of my own experiences, I've come to believe in so many strange things that I see little reason to doubt the truth of things that are beyond my experience. I kind of agree with Neville on that one. I think so, too. Um, He says, the ancient teachers warned us not to judge from appearances because, said they, the truth need not conform to the external reality to which it relates. They claimed that we bore false witness if we imagined evil against another that no matter how real our belief appears to be, how truly it conforms to the external reality to which it relates, if it does not make free the one of whom we hold the belief, it's untrue and therefore a false judgment. We're called upon to deny the evidence of our senses and to imagine as true of our neighbor that which makes him free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. To know the truth of our neighbor, we much as we must assume that he's already that which he desires to be. Any concept we hold of another that is short of his fulfilled desire will not make him free and therefore cannot be the truth. Now that's really interesting. This reminds me of what we were reading from Abraham in Money and the Law of Attraction, but when they were talking about how we think of someone else. Remember that whole chapter about how we can help someone yes. else? And it, it was saying that the way we help someone else or the way we know if our thoughts about someone are helping <laughs> the situation is do we feel good right? when yes. we're thinking about them? And, and right away, I was just convicted the moment I read that because I recognized that there were people in my life that I love dearly that I worry about sometimes. And fret over. And, you know, those worries don't do any good for that person. It's so much better to see them as I know 
they want to be and as they can see themselves and as, you know, hold them in a space where they're successful, so to speak. Well, plus I'm, and all, that's what, I'm always struck by the fact that <clears throat> when we, when we worry about somebody else, excuse me, <clears throat> when, when we worry about somebody else, when we're, um, in some way concerned about somebody else and we're, we're focusing on, Oh, I don't really like the way things are going for that person. I really want them to be in a better place. Not only are we not doing them any favors, we're not doing ourselves any favors. Right. I mean, we're, right. we're putting ourselves into a bad feeling place because we're feeling bad for them. And that means we're going to just manifest more stuff that makes us feel bad. Like, well, that's not a good plan. <laughs> no, it's so true. And, you know, we, we talk about, we remind ourselves all the time that energy entrains to itself. Right. And so, I mean, that's why this is so important, right? Doing the podcast, people listening, um, people connecting, because all of our energy is connected. And if we're envisioning success for everyone and they're envisioning it, then we're all going to be in a better place. But if we all start worrying about each other, <laughs> it's not a better place. You're right. It's not. And it's not a fun place either. That That's what amazes no. me the most. When Doesn't I, feel good. When, when I see so many people, and I've done it myself too. I mean, we've all done it, right? But mm -hmm. when, when I see so many people who get into that worry place and they just stay there and it, it makes them yeah. more and more unhappy. I mean, forget about manifesting stuff. Just look what it's doing to you emotionally. You know, it's it's like it, it rips you up. And and yet we continue to stay there. I, I, yeah. I'm a little puzzled why we do that. But we do it. Well, we do it. I mean, we do it and we become it becomes habitual because of the yeah. way our brains are made. Right. I mean, right. we start we start wiring together neural connections that sort of go on autopilot. And that's why that's why practice is so important, because we we literally take control we take back control of our mind and learn how to control our thoughts in a way that we are focused on better things mm -hmm. and it takes some work sometimes so neville says to know the truth of our neighbor we must assume that he's already that which he desires to be any concept we hold of another that is short of his de fulfilled desire will not make him free and therefore cannot be the truth Instead of learning my craft in schools where attending courses and seminars is considered a substitute for self-acquired knowledge, my schooling was devoted almost exclusively to the power of imagination. I stayed for hours imagining myself to be other than that which my reason and my senses dictated until the imagined states were vivid as reality, so vivid that passersby became but a part of my imagination and acted as I would have them. Mm -hmm. By the power of imagination, my fantasy led theirs and dictated to them their behavior and the discourse they held while I was identified with my imagined state. Okay, there's a couple points here we need to talk about, I think. First one, he stayed for hours imagining himself to be other than that, what is it, other than that which my reason and my senses dictated until the imagined state's or vivid as reality. Hours. Wow. I mean, that's like serious, what, meditation or imagining or what? Right. No, serious sessions yeah. going on. Yes. There. Right. Whoa. So that was the first thing I noticed. The second one is this last part almost sounds like something that people ask about a lot. And it, it causes me a little bit of concern. He says, let's see, where is it? So, the, so vivid that passes by become but a part of my imagination and acted as I would have them. By the power of imagination, my fantasy led, uh, led theirs and dictated to them their behavior and the discourse they held together while I was identified with my imagined state. A lot of people want to use the law of attraction to control others. And that's what I was almost hearing there. I mean, what do you think? Well, you know that I'm never on board with that. Right. Um, and that is the, the number one reason when someone you know, tries to employ me to help them get their ex back. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. Right. Because yeah. oftentimes, and here's, you know, the question there is always, um, first of all, <laughs> does your ex want to come back? <laughs> because why do we want to be with someone that doesn't want to be with us? Because yeah. at that point, then we're delving into manipulation and that's not really what anybody actually wants. Um, and so, yeah, I see what you're saying here. The interesting thing I think about this, though, by the power of imagination, my fantasy led theirs and dictated to them their behavior and the discourse they held together while I was identified with my imagined state. Um, if you notice, 
how many of the Neville stories have a scene and often the scene that that one creates has some uh, verbiage in it. And so many times when the thing manifests in reality, the people in the scene say exactly what the person had been imagining. Mm. And it's often something small and insignificant. But in other words, you know, like this woman that imagined someone would give her a a one-woman show. And the man that looked at the very first painting said, I'd like to give you a one-woman show. Now, I, she didn't say that she imagined those words, but I, that's what I see that he's talking about here, is that the power of imagination, where he says, my fantasy led theirs and dictated to them their behavior. It's like he created the scene and they played it out. So I'm not quite sure, you know, we get a little bit tangled up in, in free will there. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still always in awe when it happens because I've had it happen. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think we all have had, had, you know, some yeah. kind of an, an example like that in our lives. I, Here's I, the example. I wanted to, I wanted to do a podcast. Okay. And I did not want to create it or set it up. That part wasn't like in my, you know, my joy zone. Right. But I really wanted to to do a podcast and I just imagined it and it wasn't too much longer, maybe two weeks um, that I got an email from you hmm. saying, would you like to co-host this podcast? Right. Yeah. And I didn't know you. <laughs> No, I didn't know you. I didn't know about your podcast. I didn't know anything about it. You were not in my sphere of knowledge at the time. And vice versa. I didn't know you. I mean, literally, I picked you off of a page of coaches and I to this day can't tell you why other than, yeah, that seems like a good one. <laughs> I mean, there was not much more thought to it than that. So you could say that in your imagination, you reached out and I said, yes, sure. Yes. And in my imagination, I was wanting to do this and I got an invitation and that actually is a word that I use often um, is that I'd like an invitation I've told the universe on many occasions I'm ready for an invitation and an invitation will come an invitation to do a podcast an, ind- an invitation to write for a publication an invitation to speak somewhere whatever and so you know was was my imagination um leading yours or was yours leading mine was my imagination dictating your behavior or was your imagination dictating my behavior <laughs> and I, I don't think actually it's really either one to be honest i, 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 I think, don't either <laughs> i think what happens is that um like in the case of of us connecting to do the podcast um we both had compatible visions and yes. that's what brought it together yes but, exactly the thing that I noticed exactly. about the stories that Neville's been telling, like he told the story about the woman who wanted to get the, uh, uh, wanted to do the, uh, the, the work with kids and so forth. And yes, the conversations happened the way she wanted them to happen, but she did not specify that it had to happen with person X, with a yes. particular person. In other words, she allowed the universe to deliver to her who that person is going to be. Whereas yes. somebody who's trying to manifest an expect, they're trying to get one particular person to have the same response that they want them to have, what you call exactly. the manipulative approach. And that falls apart because unless that ex is also wanting to rekindle the relationship, it's not going to work. It's not going to work the same way as attracting somebody who's already on the same wavelength. Right. And you notice that Neville says here um, – that his imagined states were so vivid. He says so vivid that passerby. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's what you're talking about. Right. Right. He, he doesn't say so vivid that the specific people that I, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, he, it was, it was who the universe sent by. Mm-hmm. And, and you're right. Energy entrains to itself. So it makes sense that if we have a similar vision, the universe is going to let our cross, our paths cross. Exactly right. Yeah. In fact, the yeah. uh, um, the, the particular phrase, and, and this is perhaps the phrase that confuses us. Where is it here? 
Um, by the power of imagination, my fantasy led theirs. And it sounds like by leading them, what, what it's saying is, okay, if I imagine it, I am making somebody else do something. But I don't think that's what he actually means. I think what he's actually saying, when my fantasy led theirs, he was saying, if we have two people who have a similar fantasy, a similar imagination, a similar um, dream, so to speak, then mine is leading in the sense that I am initiating reaching out. And mm. they are they are responding to that, reaching out vibrationally speaking. So Well, and you know, it's interesting because my he says my fantasy led theirs. Mm-hmm. So they too were having, you know, exactly. goals, dreams, ideas, that energy that aligned. Right. It's an alignment is what it is. So for me, led is I just simply was the first one to reach out. Not yep. I am grabbing your ring in your nose and pulling you along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. Good uh, good catch. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. I'm watching the clock as well. Man's imagination is the man himself. And the world as imagination sees it is the real world. But it's our duty to imagine all that's lovely and of good report. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And then he quotes also Proverbs, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Um, I like what he says up here. Man's imagination is the man himself, and the world is imagination sees it as the real world. You know, it, that goes back to what he talked about in the paragraph that we were just discussing, mm-hmm. is that when our when our imagination, when our perception, I, I like to say when our identity becomes very clear to us, the outside world starts responding to that identity, to that energy that we've decided upon. Mm -hmm. He's, he says in meditation, when the brain grows luminous, I find my imagination endowed with the magnetic power to attract to me whatsoever I desire. Desire is the power imagination uses to fashion life about me as I fashion it within myself. So, Our desire creates something in our imagination, and that's the power that causes the things in our imagination to be outpictured in what we call reality. Yeah. I first desire to see a person seen, uh, to see a certain person or seen, and then I look at though I were seeing that which I want to see, and the imagined state becomes objectively real. I desire to hear. And then I listen as though I were hearing and the imagined voice speaks that which I dictate as though it had initiated the message. I could give you many examples to prove my arguments, to prove that these imagined states do become physical realities. But I know that my examples will awaken in all who have not met the like or who are not inclined towards my arguments, a most natural incredulity. Nevertheless, experience has convinced me of the truth of the statement. He called those things which be not as though they were. For I have in intense meditation called things that were not seen as though they were. And the unseen not only became seen, but eventually became physical realities. Now, I like the way he breaks that down, right? The unseen not only became seen, but eventually became physical realities. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's very clearly what we call law of attraction today. And I, 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 as you're reading Neville's stuff, as you're, as you're reading from the, the book here, it, it's clear to me that he was drawing these conclusions independently of what was known as the new thought movement, because he actually came after when the new thought movement first started in like the late 19th century. But I get the impression he wasn't really well versed in it. He didn't use any of the terminology that they used. He used different terminology. So he was, he was coming to these conclusions through his own experience rather than from some book he read or something like that, like the rest of right. us do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he was not um, – he's not considered to be part of – I mean, he gets thrown in with the New Thought people, but he was not part of that movement. No, that's no. Cor- that's he was, correct. He was quite independent of it and yet coming to very much the same kinds of conclusions. So while, while we might call it law of attraction, he just calls it med- meditation becoming real or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what term he would use, but – 
Um, yeah. Um, in, uh, I mean, the names of his books, you know, Awakened Imagination. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, he says, by this method, first desiring and then imagining that we are experiencing that which we desire to experience, we can mold the future in harmony with our desire. But let us follow the advice of the prophet and think only the lovely and the good. For the imagination waits on us as indifferently and as swiftly when our nature is evil as when it is good. For from us springs forth good and evil. I have set the before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Um, he doesn't finish the verse, but I believe it says choose life. <laughs> <laughs> Does it really? Okay. <laughs> um, so... So he is saying here that we need to be responsible and careful and, you know, use, use this power to create good things in the world. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, but he also makes the point that we can use it in a lot of different ways. And I don't think he really says it specifically. No, I don't see it specifically in this paragraph, but he kind of implies, and of course it's true, we will attract the stuff we don't want, even if we're not intending to, even if we're not focusing mm -hmm. on, I'm going to make something come into reality just by focusing on it, regardless of whether we're deliberately trying to make it real, we still make it real. And well, I mean, you know, he says the, Im the imagination waits on us indifferently. That's right. And he says, and as swiftly, right. It's like, so when we think about the time that we spend, you know, you were pointing out earlier that he said hours and, most of us are not spending hours with our conscious creation work. Yeah, my first try was right? one minute. <laughs> but many of us spend hours worrying about things. Yeah. So Ugh. even looking at it from that standpoint, like when we read, you know, good and evil, we we may be imagining, you know, for good, uh, ab abundance and love and health and all those things. And for evil, you know, this the mad scientist evil villain but you know even if we're just worrying about things going wrong that would fall into that category of not mm. good right. <laughs> not opposite. good <laughs> nicely said not, not good <laughs> not good so he says desire and imagination are the enchanter's wand of fable and they draw to themselves their own affinities they break forth best when the mind is in a state akin to sleep I have written with some care and detail the method I use to enter the dimensionally larger world, but I shall give one more formula for opening the door of the larger world. And then he quotes in a dream, in a vision of the night, when the deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in dreams. We're usually the servant of our vision rather than its master but the internal fantasy of dream can be turned into an external reality. And I'm not sure how much time we have. We may have to start with this dream work tomorrow. We can probably get it in because we got a little bit of a late start. We've got about six minutes left, so give it a shot. Let's give it a shot then. In dream, as in meditation, we slip from this world into a dimensionally larger world and I know that the forms in dream are not flat two-dimensional images, which modern psychologists believe them to be. They are substantial realities of the dimensionally larger world, and I can lay hold of them. I have discovered that if I surprise myself dreaming, I can lay hold of any inanimate or stationary form of the dream, a chair, a table, a stairway, a tree, and command to awake while firmly holding on the object of the dream I am pulled through myself with the distinct feeling of awakening from dream. I awaken in another sphere, holding the object of my dream to find that I'm no longer the servant of my vision, but its master for I am fully conscious and in control of the movements of my attention. It is in this fully conscious state when we are in control of the direction of thought that we call things that are not seen as though they were in this state. We call things by wishing and assuming the feeling of our wish fulfilled. Unlike the world of three dimensions where there's an interval between our assumption and its fulfillment, in the dimensionally larger world, there is an immediate realization of our assumption. The external reality instantly mirrors our assumption. Here, there is no need to wait four months till harvest. 
We look again as though we saw, and lo and behold, the fields are already white to harvest. Now, it's interesting that he says here, um, the external reality instantly mirrors our assumption because that was the thought in my mind when I woke up this morning. Uh, and I don't remember reading this, but it was that whatever happens in the 3D world, we perceive it as that it happened in the future. We read these stories and we say, well, I imagined and I imagined and every night I had this imagination and two weeks later, you know, in the future, the thing happened. But I woke up with the thought that that thing that we see in our three-dimensional world that we say manifested is just a reflection of the thing that happened in the imagination. Yeah. yeah so true. he says it mirrors our assumption. Yeah. It's true. In this dimensionally larger world, ye shall not need to fight. Set yourselves, stand ye still, see the salvation of the Lord with you. And because the greater world is slowly passing through our three-dimensional world, <laughs> we can, by the power of imagination, mold our world in harmony with our desire. Look as though you saw. Listen as though you heard. Stretch forth your imaginary hand as though you touched. And your assumptions will harden into fact. That's quite a phrase. Oh. Stretch, stretch forth your imaginary hand as though you touched. Now that that has a tangible quality for me. I mean, look as you saw. Okay, yeah. Listen as you heard. Okay, yeah. But reaching out with your hand and touching—I don't know what it is—but something about that one just makes it more real for me. I think it's really important that when we create these scenes that we're going to use um, and imagine that we are careful to involve the senses. Mm. So yeah, the sense of touch. Um, you know, one of the little vignettes Neville talks about is seeing your friend in front of you, reaching out, taking your hand, shaking your hand and congratulating you for uh, achieving this goal. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the touch involved there, the touching and seeing, hearing, you know, smelling and tasting are really good senses to bring into the imagination as well. It's also interesting. Uh, we'll create these things in this in that long paragraph you you read just a couple paragraphs ago, um, where he was talking about in dream as a, as a meditation we slip from this world into a dimensionally larger world, and and that entire paragraph, the way he he describes it, he does make reference to the fact that most often when we dream it just kind of happens to us, but he treats it like it's what some people would call a lucid dream where you are it, an it's active exactly participant, that. right? Yes. Yes. And in my experience, and I, I've cultivated some lucid dreaming about five or six years ago. Um, it really took a lot of work for me to get there. Uh, but I did. And those dreams, when, when they become lucid, they seem more real to me than reality seems. I don't, I don't know how to describe that. Okay. Yeah. And you know, there are more lots of great books out there about how to cultivate lucid dreams. I mean, what, what and, you... and how to use them to create reality, actually. So, well, yeah, right. But yeah. I mean, it, like we, we got like a minute left. So in <laughs> one minute or less, can you describe how do you do a lucid dream? <laughs> oh, that's a whole show. That's a whole show. <laughs> well, we, we should do that sometime. Well, we could do that maybe after we finish the book. But uh, that, that's an interesting <laughs> topic because I've often worried about that. I mean, there was a movie that was done about it many, many years ago. And I can't remember the name of it. But uh mm. Yeah, um, Dennis Quaid, I believe, starred in it, a very young Dennis Quaid. But, um, yeah, interesting topic. We should address that. That'd be good. Good. Hey, we'll put it on the list. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And before we go, um, I, I think people are getting the idea of just how good of a, a life coach you are. So for those who might be interested in reaching out to you, how do they reach Cindy Chavez to get a little more help? Well, they can find me online at cindychavez.com, C-I-N-D-I-E-C-H-A-V-E-Z. And same name on all of the, or most of the social medias, not all of them, but mostly Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find me there, cindychavez.com. All right. Great. I would love to have you reach out and say hello, by the way. Excellent. <laughs> well, then we'll have to continue this uh, chapter, finish up the chapter tomorrow and get on to chapter four and continue learning what uh, Neville has to tell us. So I'm looking awesome. forward to it. All right. And we hope that you'll join us next time as well here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.